let's begin with prayer. Lord, we just want to thank you so much that you are a God who saves, you're a God who redeems, and one day, uh, full redemption, not only of the believer, but of all creation, will just finally culminate in your second coming and setting up your kingdom on earth. Until then, Lord, we want to be ready for you to receive your bride, what is called the rapture of the church. We want to be ready for that, Lord. And as we begin to look at the events, as we begin to now look uh, in depth, verse by verse, here in the book of Revelation, uh, we pray that we would just understand some of the truths that are here as we just look at some preliminary thoughts, really, this morning, and we begin to launch into the book. We're excited, Lord. Speak to our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. So now we're beginning, uh, to me, officially, our, our adventure here through this exciting, uh, revealing, and really, we might say, often misunderstood book, right? In fact, if there's one word that you can use to describe this book, there are many, but I think one of them would be mysterious. Uh, there's that, that idea, this is, well, this is kind of a mysterious book, and, and there's some truth to that. In fact, for me, I kind of take a blast of the past, and I can almost see Rod Serling. He would be the one introducing the book of Re Revelation, saying, your mind is now going to be catapulted into the future, into a different dimension when the Lord comes back. It's exciting. It's mysterious. Welcome to the book of Revelation. You know, something like that, right? Those of you who know who Rod Serling, you, you get it. The older people get that one. <laughs> But, uh, but because of that, many people are fearful of this book. They're kind of fearful. Well, you know, what's, what's here, you know? And, uh, but believers should be overjoyed because there is so much truth here, and we get excited. And I sense that certainly in our own fellowship. The truth is, the longer we hang around, the more relevant we see this book becoming. And uh, just think of some of the things that have come to pass in our own day and age. Uh, we're told in the book of Revelation in chapter 9 uh, that there's going to be an army that's 200 million strong. Now, think about this. When the book of Revelation was written, 90 AD, uh, th there was no such creature. In fact, it was a very low population. And so even throughout the history of the world, how could that even happen? And yet today we know that army, uh, that uh, China has an army of over 200 million. So there we see just things coming to pass. The longer the Lord delays is coming, the more relevant it becomes. Uh, I think of Ezekiel 37 that prophesies of the fact, you know, God tells his prophet, you know, breathe out, I'm going to breathe life into these bones, and they're formed again, and we see the re- a connecting, and God says, this is the nation of Israel, and one day I'll bring them back together, and of course, May 14th, 1948, we see Israel becoming a nation again. And then in the Olivet Discourse, remember, if you've never studied, that's a good series to look at, chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew. Uh, Jesus talks about the end days, and one of the things he talks about is you're going to be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, things that we hear all the time now. And he says these are going to increase, and there's going to be famine, and there's going to be pestilence, and there's going to be earthquakes in, in many places. And what do we see? We see an escalation of all of these things. And Jesus says these are the birth beginning of the birth pangs. And when a woman begins to have those contractions as they get closer and closer together, we know that the birth is just around the corner. And Jesus says, this is what it's going to be like in my coming, that these things are going to increase. And you could do a search on your own. I didn't have time. I should have put up a graphic. But if you look at just earthquakes and volcanic activity over the last 100 years, and you put it on a chart every year, and you get now to the last decade, it goes like this, just skyrockets. And so Jesus is coming soon, and, and this, this book is becoming so, so relevant. Uh, I remember years ago seeing a little depiction, a little cartoon. It was in a newspaper, and uh, if you're young, a newspaper is, it used to be a piece of paper where they had news in it. Uh, but of course, you still have them. Uh, they still have, you know, cartoon ads on some of the internet uh, newscasts. But uh, this was a cartoon depiction. It had this, this, you know, what you might call a, a religious fanatic. You know, let's call him that. Complete with the long hair and a flowing robe, and he was holding a sign that said, "The end is near. The end is near." You know, and he was saying it. And right beside him is this well-dressed businessman. You know, and, and instead of making fun of this religious fanatic, this so-called prophet. He, he turns and he says to him, you know what? You just might be right this time. You see, because that's how the world is seeing it. As we begin to look at these things, you know what? There could be a lot of truth to what we find in God's word. And of course, it's truth because it was written by God himself. 
And so the longer we're, the Lord delays his coming, the more we're seeing these things come to pass, uh, and the Lord is going to come soon. And, and we've mentioned it before, we'll mention it many times, prophetically speaking, there's nothing that withholds Jesus for coming for his bride, what is called the rapture of the church. He could come at any time. So it's exciting to look at this book. I, I think also the, of the fact that the world is looking for a world leader. We've had our own presidents of the past talk about a new world order, and now others have made that statement in other nations. And uh, we're looking for a world leader who's going to bring peace to the Middle East crisis between Jew and Muslim and peace in the world. Well, the Bible talks about him real clearly in Revelation 13. He's called the Antichrist. And he's going to seem to be able to solve all the world's problems. We also know that the world is quite readily in going to a place of being a one world religion. I mean, you see denominations dropping, you know, the essential doctrines and saying we all need to get together as one with Muslims and, and Buddhists. And, and, you know, the world is moving towards a one world religion. And, of course, the book of Revelation talks about that guy. He's called the false prophet. So, again, we're seeing all these things come to pass. So what better time to study the book of Revelation than right now? And yet, that said, still there are people that will shy away from it. When I went to church as a young boy, I went to a particular denomination, and, and it was in the 70s, and there was the Jesus, Jesus movement was taking place, and I wasn't saved by any stretch, but I was kind of curious, so I was asking, hey, why don't we do the book of Revelation? And they said, well, we can't do the book of Revelation. We can't understand it, and we're not going to teach it. And what a tragedy. Who knows? I might have given my life to Christ back then, but you know, God in his timing saved me. But this is not a book we want to seal up. In fact, Revelation 22:10 says, don't seal up the words of this book. God wants this a book to be a book that is taught and revealed. But think about this. This book comes under attack. The devil doesn't want us reading this book or studying this book. Why? Because it speaks of the believer's you know, victory that we have in Christ and what awaits us. In fact, did you know that there are two books in the Bible that are the most attacked by Satan? They are the book of Revelation, and the other is the book of Genesis. It's interesting. It's both the first and the last book. And why is that? Well, of course, I already mentioned why Revelation is attacked, but Genesis is attacked because if the devil can lie to people on this earth saying, no, we weren't created. You weren't created. You're, you're not a sinner. Well, if you weren't created, you're not a sinner, you're not accountable to God, then you don't need a redeemer, you see. And so Satan works hard to undermine all the time the truth that's found in the book of Genesis, as well as the truth found in the book of Revelation. In fact, uh, I, I've kind of put it there in your notes right here, just an interesting correlation. I think we'll put it up on the screen right here. Uh, in the book of Genesis, just so you see the contrast, you have the commencement of heaven and earth. When you get to the book of Revelation, you have the consummation of heaven and earth. In the book of Genesis, you have the entrance of sin on earth through Adam and Eve. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate that. Every time I pull weeds in my yard, I'm thanking Adam. Um, in the book of Revelation, we have the end of sin on the earth. In Genesis, we have the beginning of sorrow. In Revelation, the end of sorrow. In Genesis, the dawn, we have the beginning. We're beginning to learn about Satan and his demons. But in Revelation, we'll have the doom of Satan and his demons. They'll be thrown into the lake of fire forever. In Genesis, the tree of life is relinquished, taken away from man. In the book of Revelation, it's regained. We find it again in the latter chapters of Revelation. In, in the book of Genesis, we have death entering. In Revelation, we have death exiting. In Genesis, the Redeemer is promised. That's good news, Jesus. In Revelation, redemption is completely accomplished. So Genesis is the foundation of our faith, and Revelation is the capstone of our faith. So let's jump into our study today. I've entitled our message, The Apocalypse, and we're going to be looking at the first eight verses this morning. And if you look at the outline, you're going to see that there are five points highlighted there. We're going to look at Revelation, then we're going to look at the writer, the reader, the recipients, and then the resource. We begin with the Revelation, and it's found right in the first part of verse one, the Revelation of who? Jesus Christ. Now, the word revelation is right there. It's apocalypse. It's the word apocalypse. It means to illuminate, to reveal, or to unveil. 
Now, for some of us, we think of the, the term apocalypse, and the first thing we think of is maybe Apocalypse Now, you know, that movie about the Vietnam War. That's not what it means. It, that, that's describing carnage. I get the idea where they make the connection, but that's not what the word means. The word literally means to unveil. Probably the best picture would be that of a monument being revealed. If you've ever gone to a park where there's been a large monument or maybe a museum and the monument is going to be revealed for the very first time, they, they might have a speaker there. They may even have a band play and the band's playing this music and this, this thing is there, but it's covered by sheets, right? A large covering. And then the band hits a crescendo and the, the guest introduces it and now here it is. And they pull away, right, the sheet and there it is, this, you know, magnificent, you know, monument. Well, that's what the book of Revelation is all about. It's all about the unveiling or the glorifying disclosure of Jesus Christ. There are many events described in the book of Revelation. However, all of them are subordinate thoughts that display and point to Jesus himself. I mean, think about this. The last time we leave Jesus, it's in the gospel accounts, right? And we just finished the gospel of John. And in the, in the Gospels, Jesus is shown as the Son of Man. He becomes, God becomes man, and he is humiliated. He is sacrificed on the cross for the sins of the world. But as we come to the book of Revelation, we see him now coming in all of his glory. And so the singular wor uh, theme of this book is just that. It's all about the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, in chapters 1 through 3 then... We see Jesus exalted over his church. We'll look at the churches. He's exalted over the church. In chapters 4 and 5, we have Jesus as the glorified Lamb of God. When we get to chapters 16 through 18, we see Jesus as the triumphal judge over the earth. And then we'll conclude, well, actually, chapter 19, you see him coming in glory. That's in his full glory, chapter 19, the second coming of Jesus. And then in chapters 20 through 22, we see him as the exalted bridegroom, now bringing in and setting up his kingdom on the earth. So the sum and the subject of the whole book, if you think of one word, revelation, think Jesus Christ. That's what it's about, revealing Jesus Christ. So John introduces that thought, and he continues in verse 1, which God gave to him to show his servants. The servants, it means believers. This whole book is written to express this truth to believers and, of course, to the whole world that they might be believers. He adds things which must shortly take place. Now, a couple of thoughts here. First of all, by saying these things will shortly take place, John is certainly saying that these things are going to be fulfilled soon. John is saying the second coming of Christ is not far away. And, of course, the problem we have with that is, wait, is, uh, hold on a second. Uh, John wrote this 2,000 years ago, and he says he's not short, short from coming. He's coming soon. How could that be possible? It's been 2,000 years. But, again, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 says, one day is as 1,000 years to the Lord, and 1,000 years is like one day. So to the Lord, it's just been a couple of days, Right? And then there's another thought that the term shortly here must shortly take place. The Greek term is intekai. That might be familiar to us because we get our English word tachometer from it. If you like to drive fast in your car and you might even, you're watching that tachometer, right? The, the word literally means with speed. That's what the word means. So John is saying these things are going to happen soon, and when they happen, they're going to happen very quickly or with speed. Jesus described it this way in Matthew 24, 27. As lightning comes from the east and shines to the west, so will the Son of Man be. So the deception of the devil is to make us think, oh, you got plenty of time. <laughs> They've been saying that for 2,000 years. Lord's delaying is coming. Come on, dude, take it easy, man. But here we read right here, no, he's coming soon, and when it happens, it'll happen very quickly. Now, let's move on, and let's talk about the writer. We find this, too, as well in verse 1. Uh, John is writing, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Now, again, this is a book of signs. We're going to talk about that a lot. We'll see that a lot. And we're told here that an angel signified it. This message is so, so signified it and brought it. It came by way of an angel. 
And by the way, we're going to see a lot of angels in the book of Revelation. They're mentioned some 67 times. And we would also say this, that the author of this book, certainly we could say is the Holy Spirit, right? In 2 Peter 1, 21, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's Genesis to Revelation, all written by the Holy Spirit. But we also know the Holy Spirit used human agents to communicate this truth. And so who wrote this book? Well, he tells us right here. It's the Apostle John. John wrote this book. When did he write it? He wrote it around 90 A.D. And we know where he wrote it from. He wrote it, because we're going to see this in latter chapters, from the island of Patmos. Now, Patmos is an island just off the coast of Greece. You could visit it today, and there are people that actually live there. But in John's day, it was a modern-day Alcatraz. Now, those of you who don't know what Alcatraz is, that's a, that's a little prisoner's island right off the coast of San Francisco. But in John's day, it was a rock quarry, and they would send prisoners of Rome there to quarry stone to build Rome's monuments. It wasn't a great place. But here, uh, here is John, and he received this revelation to write this down there. So think about this. Good news came out of a bad place, <laughs> that's, and that's good news. Um, but think about this. That's, you might think that that's where you are in your life right now. You might think your life is nothing more than a, a rocky island. You feel isolated. It's not a great place. Well, let me tell you, great things can happen in a bad place when you place your trust in Jesus Christ. If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, I encourage you, be open to making a commitment to him, even today. And so John writes in verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all that he saw. So he says, I, I, I bore witness or I'm bearing witness. That means I'm testifying. I'm testifying. And he says it's a threefold testimony. I bear witness to the word of God, stressing the fact that this is the inspired word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, that uh, he's testifying to the veracity of the revelation that Jesus has given, and to all things that he saw. So John is saying, believe this, what I'm writing here, because it's the word of God. Believe this because Jesus testifies it's true. And, and believe it, I'm telling you, I saw it. I, I was there, I saw it. John says something very similar in John 19, 35, when he finishes the gospel of John. He says, I'm telling you, my testimony is true that you might believe. And that's exactly what he's saying here. He simply writes this as he begins the letter saying, maybe in our terms, saying, um, this is not speculation. I'm not giving you the words of a weatherman, you know? And you know what I mean by that, right? What, what kind of job is that? Isn't that the perfect job to be a weatherman or a weatherwoman? I mean, you go up there every day and you could be wrong half the time, you still get a job. Do you know any other job that you can do this like that? That's a great job. Hey, today it's going to rain. It's sunny. Oh, got that wrong. That's all right. Next day, it's going to be sunny and it rains. Oh, you still got a job. How long have you been working? I've been working here years, man. I just get up there. I tell people what they want to hear. I'm wrong most of the time. It doesn't matter. John just wants you to know, I'm not giving you the words of a weatherman. No, I'm not making an education, educated guess. No, I'm telling you the truth. My eyes saw it. I bear witness to the truth. By the way, John uses the phrase, I heard, 28 times in the book of Revelation. In other words, I actually heard these words. By the way, that's four sevens, right? And then he uses the phrase, I saw, I looked, and I beheld, 49 times in the book of Revelation, or seven sevens. John wants us to know beyond a shadow of doubt, I'm not dreaming this up. Um, the revelation I have here and that I'm writing is not the byproduct of a late night Patmos burger. You know what I'm saying? Indigestion, you know, I don't know what that was, man. No. John was propelled into the future by the Holy Spirit to pen and to write these very things that he saw. By the way, this brings up an interesting conversation, and we talked about it when we ended the Gospel of John. If you remember, in the last chapter of John, remember Jesus has ascended or he's, you know, risen from the dead, and before he ascends to heaven, he visits his disciples for a 40-day period. And he meets his disciples on the shores of Galilee. And there he reinstates Peter. Remember, Peter's gone back to fishing, and Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, do you love me? You know I love you. Do you love me? And Peter's a little frustrated, yes. And, of course, Jesus asked him three times because three times Peter denied him. And, and then Jesus tells Peter, you know, you're going to follow me. Yes, you do love me, Peter, because Peter says, you know, I love you. 
Well, I just want you to know, Peter, for following me, it's gonna be martyrdom. You're gonna be crucified. Men will take you where you don't wanna go, but follow me. And then Peter's following with Jesus. They all get up and walk. And, and after Jesus says, hey, it's gonna cost your life, Peter turns around to John, who wrote this, who wrote this, and says, what about him? <laughs> you remember that? And Jesus says, don't worry about him. That's how our kids are. What about them? Don't worry about them. And then Jesus says these words. He says, what if I will that John remains until I come? What is that to you, Peter? You follow me. And it goes on to say that there was a rumor that John would never die until the second coming of Jesus. Now, we know that John did die. But the truth is John was able to live long enough to actually see the second coming of Jesus Christ. How? Here he is on the island of Patmos, and he receives this revelation. He's transported to the future to actually see the second coming of Jesus Christ. Pretty spectacular. So we see the revelation in the writer. Let's now talk about us. That's the reader. John writes in verse 3, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and who keep the things that are written in it, for the time is near. Now, now think about that. We are blessed. You and I are just blessed to read it and hear this book, right? Isn't that amazing? That ought to keep us coming back Sunday after Sunday just for that alone. Isn't that kind of cool? There's a built-in, yet, isn't it interesting? The enemy says, no, don't read the book of Revelation. You can't understand it. Don't do it. But right here, we read in the first three, right from the very beginning. We're blessed in just reading it and hearing it and seeking to study it. By the way, all of these are present participles, which speak of present tense. It could read, blessed are those who continue to read it, who continue to hear it, who continue to seek and keep it. So there's many blessings in, you know, just getting into this book. But that being the case, it's important we know how to read it, that we know how to interpret it, right? Because there's been a lot of crazy things that people have said the book of Revelation is all about. So that said, I, I just right up front want to let you know where we're going for the next, you know, seven or eight months. How are we going to interpret this book? There are essentially four ways, four ways that people interpret this book. The first is called the preterist approach. This interpretation regards the book of Revelation as specifically applying to all of the persecutions during the early church age. In other words, all the judgments and everything that we read in this book refer specifically to the Roman Empire upon the early church. The problem with that is that you have to explain then a large portion of the book that really deals with future that seems quite obvious. The second approach is what is called a historical approach. Now, that might seem kind of strange. Well, of course it's history. But what you need to understand is it's a historical approach from, church, from a church perspective. This interpretation regards the book of Revelation as a chronological sequence of the history of church from the time of Christ until the present day. And the problem with that is that there's little continuity. It forces symbols to speak of, sec of certain things. In other words, well, this represents Islam. This represents the Ottoman Empire. This represents the period of Napoleon and so forth. The problem with that interpretation is very, cl very clear. The majority of the book of Revelation takes place during a literal period of seven years. So it's hard to span that over 2,000. Uh, the third approach is what is called an idealist approach. And, and this interpretation sadly interprets the whole book of Revelation as one giant allegory or one giant parable written to encourage believers to overcome evil. In other words, it's all pictures. It's all signs. And, of course, the problem with that being 100% allegory, 100% parable, it, you could literally then take whatever symbol or allegory you want and make it say whatever you want. And of course, people have been doing that for years. So that said, we will take the fourth approach, and that is what is called the futurist approach. Now, they might say, well, what, what does that mean, the futurist approach? The futurist approach uh, believes that the book of Revelation should be interpreted literally. In other words, there'll be a literal tribulation, there'll be a literal persecution, there'll be a literal reign of Jesus Christ on earth, there'll be a literal new heaven and new earth. The, the futurist approach sees chapters one through three, which is the smallest portion of the book, as already passed, and chapters four to 22 as being the future. That's why it's called the futurist approach. 
And of course, we as a church interpret the Bible literally. That is the way we interpret the book. So we take a futurist approach. But I thought that's important to mention that so we know where we're going. We're not going to be doing uh, this symbol represents this. Why? Well, because of something that happened in this such a date and that over there. And then we try, try to cram it in the text. The reality is when we're going to be looking at numbers, when we're going to look at symbols, we're going to allow the Bible to interpret itself and we'll see how it makes sense. So we see the revelation, the writer, and now us, the reader. Well, let's look at the recipients, those to whom John was originally writing to. We find it in verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, these were seven literal churches. When he talks about Asia, he's not talking about the continent of Asia. He's referring to Asia Minor. This is now the area of modern-day Turkey. And you can go over to Turkey, and you can actually visit the seven sites of these churches. When we go on our footsteps of Paul, we'll actually go to Ephesus, one of the greatest uh, digs that's over there. <clears throat> massive, massive library, several amphitheaters, and it's a huge, it's spread over a large area, and only 10% of the city has been uncovered. And of course, this is where one of the seven ancient wonders of the world was, the Temple of Diana. So a quite fascinating place. Now, we're going to be looking at those seven churches in detail when we get to chapters 2 and 3. By the way, notice there are seven of them. This is the, right here is the first mention of the first seven in the book of Revelation. And it's mentioned more than any other number. In fact, can I tell you a few things that we're going to see of sevens? We're going to see, as we see here, seven churches. There's going to be seven spirits, candlesticks, stars, lamps, seals, horns, eyes, angels, trumpets, thunders, heads, crowns, plagues, bulls, mountains, kings, and the list goes on. It's a lot of sevens, right? It's a lot of them. Why is it used? Well, it's used, first of all, where's the first place we see seven? Y'all know that. It's Genesis, right in the very beginning. God creates all things in six days, and what does he do on the seventh? He rests. That's right. He rests. And, and for that reason, we find the number seven throughout the scriptures. It's not just used to speak of rest, though they were to give the land rest after seven years, though they were to rest on the seventh day. There were many other times we see the number seven used. In fact, more than just for rest. No child could be circumcised until the seventh day passes. When the children of Israel walked around Jericho and the walls came down, seven days on the seventh day, seven times. Naaman was baptized or dipped into the Jordan seven times. Nebuchadnezzar went insane and was crazy for seven years in regard to judgment. And again and again, you find this even in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we have Jesus speaking seven Beatitudes. We have seven petitions in the Lord's Prayer. We have Jesus making seven I am statements. And yes, on the cross, he spoke seven times. Why, why 777? Seven, seven? What's so important? What does it signify? Well, seven speaks of completion, of fullness. If there's one thing God wants us to know about the book of Revelation, it's this. The consummation of redemption is accomplished when this book is done. Revelation is all about fulfilling God's redemptive purpose. So the recipients in the first part of verse 4 are the seven churches of Asia Minor. And then, of course, it's written for all of us to be ready for Christ's coming. And then finally, we'll look at the rest of our time uh, right here in the middle of verse 4 to verse 8, looking at the resource. And the question is, who does this book come from? John is writing, but he wants us to know where the information is coming from. Now, it begins with a common greeting. Again, this is just the beginning of the letter. He says, grace and peace. Grace is our standing through faith in Jesus Christ. It's our standing in God. And the result of that is peace. When I stand in God's grace, I experience the peace of God. But, but where does this grace and peace come from? Who's writing this? It's from him. From him who was and who is and is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. This book is ultimately given to us from three people. And then who is that? That is the Trinity. It is the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. First, the description of the Father, who was, who is, and is to come. This speaks of God's transcendency. In Isaiah 46.10, God says this, I am God. I declare the very end actually from the beginning and from ancient times things that haven't even been accomplished. So think about a giant uh, film reel. 
if you would, right? And, and we see life one frame at a time. Blunk, blunk, blunk. That's what we see. But imagine if you were able to have this eternal perspective or a further perspective, and you could roll that whole film out from beginning to end. You could see that whole thing from end, beginning, beginning, and everything in, in the middle, in between. And imagine that being all of creation, all of life, the consummation of everything. That's what God sees. He sees it all in real time. He's the transcendent one. This is a description of God. And so John is saying this letter comes to you from God and, secondly, from the seven spirits before his throne. Now, someone say, well, that might be angels. Maybe these spirits are referring to angels. But no, the very fact that he couples it between a description of the Father and the Son, all commentators concur. This is a description of the Holy Spirit. We say, then, why, why use this term seven spirits? Again, because the number seven speaks of fullness. Some translate and say John could be saying this letter comes by way of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's a good way to translate it. We also read in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, about the sevenfold work of the Spirit. Isaiah 11, 2 says, This is the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of power, the Spirit of knowledge, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. That, that is a description of the Spirit. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And then he says, in just the first part of verse 5, And this letter comes to you from Jesus Christ. So John says, this letter comes from the triune God. Now, his last description, it comes from the Father, comes from the Spirit, and it comes from Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus is the sum and the substance of this book, so he illuminates on that. Who is Jesus? Well, he is the faithful witness. He gives three titles here. He is the faithful witness, he's the firstborn of the dead, and he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, Jesus is the faithful witness. In Isaiah 55, 4, it says, God says, I'm making him a witness to the people. Jesus came to testify God to man. And he was perfectly faithful in everything he did. He said, I always do those things that please the Father. He's a faithful witness. And then secondly, he says he's the firstborn from the dead. Now, he doesn't say that he's the first to rise from the dead because that wouldn't be true. God raised people from the dead in the Old Testament before Jesus. And then Jesus comes on the scene and he raised people from the dead before he raised himself from the dead. What makes him unique is the fact that, yes, he says, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it. So first of all, he raised himself from the dead. But it means more than that. The term firstborn is the Greek word prototokos. And it literally means the preeminent one. In Colossians 1.18, it says, Jesus is the prototokos, the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he has supremacy. So you could say he is the faithful witness. He is the supreme one. He's the prototokos. And then thirdly, he's the ruler over all the kings of the earth. Some translations may say he's the prince over all the earth. But the Greek word is archon and literally means chief ruler. Jesus is the chief ruler of all rulers. Or it's described when we get to Revelation chapter 19. He is the king of all kings, and he is the Lord of all lords. So three titles. And I would say that these three titles coincide with Jesus' three offices. You say, well, where's that at? Well, when you read the scriptures, Jesus is the only one. First of all, a king, in the, an Israeli king, could never be a priest. He was never allowed to do that. That was kept, A priest could never be the king. And none of them were prophets. You, you might have some people that fulfilled two offices, like a prophet and a priest was a time. But no one fulfilled three offices, prophet, priest, and king, except Jesus. And Jesus, as a prophet, he testifies that which is true, the faithful witness. As priest, Jesus, of course, represented God by not only bringing a sacrifice, but by bringing himself. He is the prototokos from the dead, the supreme one. And then thirdly, as a king, he rules a kingdom. And we're told here, he is the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. I would also add that as a prophet, he is God's word. As a priest, he is God's lamb. And as a king, he is God's lion. So it's pretty exciting. So all of heaven now uh, is, is probably getting exciting as it get lined up for the things that are gonna come. But Again, John is just introducing us in this letter and also to him. He also describes Jesus saying, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Man, 
You read that a bunch of times, it's, it's encouraging. Jesus loved me. As a believer, he washed me from my sins in his own blood. Can you imagine that? By the way, the term wash there, past tense, or really it's aorist tense, which means a once and for all act. You don't have to get washed again and again and again in the blood. Sometimes we say, wash me in the blood. I get that, and that's great, but I want you to know the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Your sins, past, present, and, and, and future are forgiven. So that Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation, no more. I no longer have to be condemned. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Man, that's good news. How comforting is that? In fact, not only did he do this for us, he adds in verse six, and you know what else he does? Not only does he forgive us, he makes us kings and priests to his God and Father. He's making me a king and a priest before God. That's just incredible. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. I say amen to that. Because the Bible tells me in Romans chapter six, I was a slave to sin. I was a slave. I was a servant. And now he makes me a king, a priest before God. Incredible, incredible. And now John says in verse seven, behold, which means pay attention. Listen, this is important. And again, we're just getting into the first part of the letter, but this is important. He wants us to know this from the very beginning. We don't get to see this until chapter 19, but he's giving us just a little glimpse. Behold, he is coming. He is coming, and he's coming. This same Jesus I described, the faithful witness, the archagon, the supreme one, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, and they also who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen, or amen means yes, it is so. So first he says Jesus is coming with clouds. It's kind of interesting. Jesus is coming in clouds. He left in clouds. He did? Yeah. Yeah. After appearing with his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection, you read it in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. Jesus is now with his disciples. He's finally passed the baton. He's given them all the instruction. And he says, I'm going, guys. And all of a sudden, he just, a cloud takes him into the air. A cloud takes him. And the disciples are sitting around. They're watching it. And while they're watching, a couple of angels, we're told the two angels joined him. You know, so they're looking. Yeah, see, you see that? Yeah. Oh, oh. What are you doing, you know? And there's two angels, and, and, and the angels say to the disciples, why are you staring up into heaven? This same Jesus who went up in the clouds in heaven will return in like manner. So Jesus went up in clouds, and we're told that he's gonna come back in clouds. And then he says, and every eye will see him. Now, how is that possible? Every eye's gonna see him? Well, if you were with us last week, and we just did a quick overview, but in Revelation chapter 16, as we're in the final bold judgments leading up right into the second coming of Jesus Christ, we are told that it is pitch black on the earth. So it'll be pitch black on the earth, and men will be at war. All those remaining on the earth, which is not a large population left, they'll all be gathered in the valley of Armageddon in battle and at war with one another, the pitch black darkness. Now, let me tell you, you can see light a long ways in darkness. During World War II, there were uh, blackouts ordered by Churchill during the Second World War there because the Nazis were coming and they were bombing London. And, and it was said that they could see a match from over two miles away in their planes. And so Churchill ordered, not even a match, don't even light a match. That was hard for him. He liked to smoke himself, you know, so even... You know, he didn't do that. But think about this. One little match you can see from two miles away. Can you imagine what it's like when it's pitch black on the earth and Jesus comes back with all of his Shekinah glory, piercing the darkness? I mean, every eye will see the Lord. That's pretty awesome. They also, it says, who pierced him? What's that a reference to? Well, Zechariah 12, 10, it's a reference to the Jews. There'll be those that will realize he's the savior we pierced. Now, some during the tribulation we know will give their lives to Christ. There'll be a great outpouring during the great tribulation and many Jews will give their lives to Christ. Many will not. In fact, most of the earth will not turn to Jesus and that's why it says all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Why? Because they didn't embrace him. And so for some who give their life during the tribulation, which is a horrible, horrible time, they'll look forward to it, but the majority will mourn because of them because it's a day of judgment. Now, the thing I have to say right here is it doesn't have to be a day of judgment for anyone. It's certainly not for us. 
You know, because listen, the book of Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 10, and by the way, it's in other places in the Bible, it says this, that there's coming a day where every knee will bow, every, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those in heaven, those living on earth, and those under the earth. In other words, every single person who has ever lived will one day bow the knee and confess Jesus Christ is God. Even those who have rejected God, those who have long since passed, atheists who said, I hate you, God, I don't want you. One day they will bow the knee and they will confess, you are God. That'll happen. But listen, I want to do it while I'm living. <laughs> because when I do it while I'm living, I know then where I'm going. I won't be going in hell. I'll be joining Jesus in the rapture. And so you got, everybody's going to have to do it. So my thing is, why not do it now if you've never done it? This could be your opportunity today to bow the knee and confess your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Because when you get that, and when you do that, not only do you get right with your maker, but man, you get forgiveness of sin, washed in the blood, a new identity. The Bible tells us the old man, the old Ron, gone. Now, I still fight with my flesh because my, my flesh remembers, you know, it's, it's, it's got some bounce back memory of old things, right? I gotta put to death the flesh but I'm no longer controlled by my flesh. For the very first time in my life, I could say no to sin and yes to God. I could never do that before, never. I was just, I just did what I wanted to do and I had no control at all. But now, through Jesus Christ, I have victory over the flesh. I have peace with God, the peace of God. He gives me that whole new identity. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. That is all possible when you surrender to him. So why put it off when it's too late? When you can do it today and just come before Jesus as your maker, as your God, and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I want new life in you. And he'll do that. He'll give you new life. Well, there's one last verse I want to look at. That's verse 8. And these are the first words of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Here they are. He says, I'm the Alpha. I'm the Omega. I'm the beginning. I'm the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The first, by the way, of seven I Am statements by Jesus in the book of Revelation Alpha and Omega, those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And, and so he says, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, I'm the transcendent one. The same term uh, used, by the way, notice as he continues, who is present, who was past, and who is to come. That's future. But, but he's essentially saying, I'm, I'm God, because that's the same term we use to describe the Father in verse 4. So Jesus is introducing himself as the transcendent one, right? Right? The one who knows the beginning from the end. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. And then he puts it clearly. I am the Almighty. Pantocrator is the word. It means, best way to translate it is the omnipotent one, the all-powerful one. And isn't it interesting, in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, so hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, and we use this scripture very often at Christmas time on Christmas cards. The prophet is saying, unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given, and his name will be, this child born will be wonderful counselor, mighty God. Same word. He's the mighty God, everlasting father. This little child is who? He is the father. He is the mighty God. Jesus said, I and the father am one. A clear, a clear declaration that Jesus Christ is God. So the only question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for his return? Listen, he, as I said before, he could come for his church at any time. But you have to be ready. You know, you can have your whole life in order. And when your whole life is really centered on Jesus, you're ready. I'll, I'll close with this. I, I've shared this before, but there was a father. And he came home from work, and he was real tired, you know, and and uh, he had a little four-year-old boy. And the four-year-old boy, as soon as dad comes home, wants to play with him. But dad just said, man, I just need a few minutes to chillax, you know, in the chair. So he grabbed a newspaper and, and it had a picture of the world on it, uh, you know, that was taken from, you know, from space of, the, of, of Earth, looking back. And so he, he cut it out, and he cut it in some little pieces, like a little puzzle. He said, son, here's some tape. He figured he'd buy himself about a half an hour rest. And then he'd play with his son. He says, you put this thing together, and when you're done, Daddy will play with you. Well, his son came back 
in less than five minutes. He's like, oh, how did you do it? He had, he had the whole thing taped and put together. He said, how do you do that? He said, well, Dad, on the other side of the paper, you know, there was a picture of this man. It was actually an article on Jesus. So a picture of this Jesus. And it was easy to put together the picture with the eyes, the nose, here. and I put it all together. And when I put that man together, the whole world came together. And I thought, well, isn't that how it is with us? When, when, we, when we put Jesus at the center of our life, our whole world comes together. And the whole, the whole scheme of everything makes sense. So if you don't know the Lord, you can know him today. And when you put him in the center of your life, everything falls into place. Jesus said if you would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all things will take place. All things will be added unto you. So let's pray.